Good morning. Thank you all for, for being here. Uh, those of you in person and those of you uh, online, I certainly appreciate it. I want to begin uh, this morning by uh, saying thank you to the men and women in uniform behind me. Uh, I have to thank each and every one of them uh, and all of the colleagues that they represent for everything that they do every single day to keep us Mississippians safe. When it comes to law enforcement, these men and women represent the absolute best of the best in our nation. Mississippi's law, inform law enforcement officers have been through a lot over the last couple of years, but despite it all, they have endured. Well, actually, they've done a little more than endure. They've excelled. They had to bring the same level of professionalism day in and day out despite a litany of dangerous rhetoric by politicians and talking heads about those who serve in this profession. Broad, sweeping characterizations about who they are and what they stand for simply based on their line of work. Some have called policing inherently and intentionally racist. There were calls to defund the police, to dismantle them, and claims that doing so, at least in one case, would, quote, get rid of the cancer. Some politicians even said they could imagine, they could imagine a future without the police. There's really no other way to describe it. Some of the language that has been thrown around at them has been downright crazy. And in some cases, it has made their job even more difficult, and it has made their job even more dangerous. Today I come to say to all of the law enforcement officers in our state, I'm incredibly sorry you've had to put up with that talk and that rhetoric. I'm sorry you've had to deal with politicians around America and talking heads who have no desire to understand and learn more about you and your profession. I want you to know that as long as I'm governor, Mississippi will always have your back. My administration will do everything in our power to ensure that you have the resources and the support that you need to do your job safely and to do it effectively. As long as I'm governor, Mississippi will continue to back the blue. And as if this assault on law enforcement profession wasn't enough, they've also had to deal with the global pandemic. You see, these men and women behind me and the people they represent, they didn't have the option of telework. They couldn't work from home on a laptop. No, instead, they've done what they always do. They get up every day to protect and serve our communities with honor. Day in and day out, they put their own health on the line to keep us safe. I want all of our state's law enforcement officers to know that my administration and our residents recognize the sacrifices that you've made over these last two years. We are incredibly proud of you and everything you've done. We are lucky to have you and we will always appreciate you. Something that really stood out to me over the last two years was our officers' attitude. They never complained. They didn't feel sorry for themselves. They didn't give up under the intense pressure. Rather, they stepped up and they stood strong. They were role models. They proved to people what being a law enforcement officer in Mississippi was all about. Our state could not be more pleased with their efforts over the last two years. Due to the hazardous duties and mountains of challenges that they encountered, I have authorized $1,000 in hazard pay funded by my office's Discretionary CARES Act funds for each sworn law enforcement officer who actively served during the COVID-19 state of emergency and who was employed by state agencies as of November 30th, 2021. Our state law enforcement officers will receive this hazard pay by the end of this 
calendar year. This one-time payment at Christmas time will be a small recognition of the service of those who put their safety on the line every single day. Now, we'll never be able to fully repay our officers for everything they've done for us over the last two years. We'll probably never be able to fully repay our officers for the increased risk of being exposed to COVID while performing their duties throughout the pandemic and throughout this state of emergency. But here's one thing that I can guarantee you. We're never going to stop trying. Everything you've been through over the last few years merits this hazard pay. You've earned every single penny. Again, I want to personally thank the officers who could join us today and to all those serving our great state. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to our Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety, uh, someone who has advocated for this hazard pay for many, many months, and someone who is going to introduce one of our state troopers to say a few words. Commissioner? Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. First and foremost, I would like to thank all the members of law enforcement that make sacrifices on a daily basis to protect our communities, our homes, our family, and our friends. It is a job that never sleeps and one that entails the utmost sacrifice. So thank you for all law enforcement. I'd also like to thank Colonel Randy Ginn, Mississippi Highway Patrol. It was with his leadership and his vision and his knowledge that I was first learned of hazard pay and its availability for law enforcement in Mississippi. And I'd like to thank our governor. I can tell you that Governor Reeves has always answered the calls that I have made for support of law enforcement. He has put the weight of the governor's office behind that support and driven issues day in and day out to help support law enforcement. And when I brought this to his office, he wanted to do it right away. And I'm so happy that we've been able to do this at this time of year to help support law enforcement officers and their families. I met earlier with one of our troopers, M8 Trooper Craig James. Talked a little bit about his family, his daughter Olivia and their son Rhett. And talked about the impact that it's going to have on them during this time of year. Because the reality is that law enforcement officers often have to work second jobs or work with two different agencies just in an effort to make ends meet. This type of hazard pay being offered this time of year will help alleviate those worries and concerns. So again, thanking all of those individuals, the governor, Colonel Ginn, and all law enforcement. We appreciate what you do. And I'm gonna turn it over to Trooper Craig James and let him talk about the impact that it's had on he and his family, knowing that this hazard pay is coming at this time of year. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Commissioner. Again, um, like the Commissioner said, this it's very humbling that the Governor would have thought about us this time of year uh, to give us this money to help kind of offset some of the costs that come with the holiday season. Uh, it, would, it will help out tremendously. My wife has been picking up extra shifts. Maybe she can knock that back a little bit with this money. Uh, I want to thank the Governor and thank the citizens of the state of Mississippi as well for this kind and, and generous gift. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks everyone for being here. Before I open it up for questions, there's one more group of people I'd like to thank. And that's the family members of our law enforcement officers. Just like these men and women who put on the uniform every day, their families often don't get the recognition that they deserve. To all of our state's law enforcement families, thank you. We are deeply grateful for all of your sacrifices and for sharing your loved ones with us. Without your love and your support, they wouldn't be able to work as hard as they do to keep us safe. It's been a great honor for me to stand alongside these brave men and women today to recognize their selfless service and their dedication to the great state of Mississippi. 
I look forward to our state standing shoulder to shoulder with them for many years to come. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that y'all have. Emily, we'll start with you. Governor, I wanted to ask you if you have numbers on how many officers will be receiving this pay and what's the total price tag for it? Yes, yeah, so um, this, this pay is applicable to all sworn law enforcement officers uh, that work um, for the state of Mississippi. There's approximately 1,750 of them. Uh, obviously, we are getting uh, final numbers um, as, as we move over the next couple of days, but approximately 1,750. Uh, we are going to, uh, this gets a little more technical than, than people really care, but we're going to also pick up the tab for the fringe on that $1,000 uh, in hazard pay so that the actual uh, um, a thousand dollars actually it's it's a little more than that but that's what actually gets in their pocket um, and it is applicable to all of those who work for the following state agencies attorney general auditor's office department of revenue gaming commission mental health Depart department of mental health agriculture and commerce department of marine resources department of wildlife fisheries and parks pearl river valley water supply district the insurance department as well as of course the department of public safety um, a little over half of those certainly work at the um, Department of Public Safety, uh, but all in total, there's approximately 1,750 across all state agencies. So somewhere in the neighborhood of 2.3, 2.4 million. Yes, sir. Governor, recently a new caucus has been formed, the Mississippi Legislative First Responders Caucus, and I was wondering if you've been able to work with them or talk with them as they're getting ready for the legislative session to discuss possible pay raises for police officers here in the state. Yeah, we, we've certainly uh, had uh, n numerous conversations with individual members uh, of the legislature over the last uh, uh, several months, and um, I think that there is a, a real opportunity uh, to, to take this model of hazard pay, and, and, and I think when you think about um, uh, our uh, other men and women uh, that wear the uniform in uh, city and county government, uh, I think this would be a, a model that, that could potentially uh, be utilized to expand uh, what we are able to do uh, obviously um, with the discretionary CARES Act monies that um, the legislature saw fit uh, to uh, to give uh, us in, in the governor's office we were able to do this particular um, uh, hazard pay uh, but there's been a lot of men and women in uniform uh, throughout the state and city and county governments uh, that I would argue uh, the legislature should should consider um, there's also a, a lot of uh, heroes that, that are in the um, EMT world, and I think we should look at, at them as well as a potential uh, way in which to invest uh, more uh, monies. I think it's something that, um, that would be well received throughout the state, and I think it's a, a way for, for us uh, to, again, say thank you. Make no mistake, uh, these men and women don't work for the money. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't get up and, and do what they do uh, for big salaries or, or anything like that, but it is a way for us to show um, just a token of our appreciation uh, during uh, this season. Courtney. Governor, I know I've heard the commissioner talk about it in the budget hearings, but wanted to know if you had had any conversations with leadership or anyone over at the Capitol regarding extending the death benefit for the law enforcement officers who had died due to COVID. Yes, we, we have had uh, multiple conversations uh, over the last several months, I am 110% uh, supportive of that effort. And, and quite frankly, uh, I think that um, most people uh, within the Capitol are as well. So I, th I would anticipate uh, that that's something that should be able to get done uh, and get done very quickly. I haven't had any conversations within the last week or two to suggest otherwise. So um, I think there's unilateral support um, for that purpose. Yes, Hunter Dawkins with the Gazebo Gazette. Sure. Go, thank you, Governor. Uh, this just quick question. Um, based on the start of the legislative session, do you plan on introducing this model included in your budget that you're going to present to the legislature? Well, uh, obviously, the, the legislature has uh, $1.8 billion in uh, monies uh, from the um, ARPA bill that passed uh, in the Congress. Uh, in addition to that, we have we collected over a billion dollars more in 
um, total revenue in the fiscal year that ended June 30th and was originally budgeted against. In addition to that, in the first five months of this fiscal year, in, Jan in, uh, in July through November, we collected almost $500 million more uh, than was budgeted against. So uh, the legislature literally has billions and billions and billions of dollars uh, that needs to be allocated. And they are all aware of my strong uh, desire to, um, to uh, make sure that we invest those monies uh, in, in opportunities to, um, to uh, reward and to thank um, and to provide hazard pay uh, for law enforcement officers. And they also know that uh, we've got a unique opportunity with those state and federal dollars to do exactly that. We also have a unique opportunity to invest in our future. And I, I heard uh, Lieutenant Governor Hoseman say recently, and I just met with him, I believe it was last week, uh, and, and he and I are completely on the same page in that for the investment of these dollars, we want there to be multi-generational effects. This is not just to change things for the next year or two, but for the next year, one or two generations. Yes, ma'am. Bobby Harrison has a question. Great. Uh, Governor, just uh, explain the mechanics of how the CARES Act money works. I mean, I, I thought that, I mean, and I, I guess I'm obviously wrong, but I thought that money had to be spent by now. How much more do you have? Uh, or is this all of it? And do you anticipate spending some, how do you anticipate spending the rest of it if it is? And if I asked a follow-up question, it just got away. Uh, we all appreciate and honor law enforcement, but in your opening comments, do you not acknowledge that there's been mistakes made by individual officers or uh, that have uh, that, that should not go unnoticed and, and questioned and even prosecuted over the past several years? Yeah, so I'll answer both questions, Bobby. The uh, Merry Christmas to you, by the way. Um, the, um, the the initial question. Uh, the remaining discretionary monies uh, at our uh, disposal are s just less than $5 million, and they will, um, including this, will be uh, spent uh, by the end of this calendar year, so before December 31. Um, and so this is one of three or four things that we're spending these dollars on uh, as we move towards the end of it. Um, with respect to uh, your question earlier, um, I certainly acknowledge uh, that there have been mistakes made. Um, there have been um, uh, instances in which uh, mistakes were made. Uh, there have also been uh, instances where um, one or two, uh, one or two or three uh, individuals uh, made bad decisions, and in some instances may have been uh, bad people to begin with. That happens sometimes. But there are literally 700,000 sworn law enforcement officers across America and there have been those politicians and there have been those talking heads across America over the last couple of years who've tried to take all 700,000 of them and, and throw them in the same briar patch with one or two or three uh, individuals that have made mistakes or may have even been bad people. And, and I think uh, that's where I want to make sure that we differentiate that the overwhelming and massive majority of men and women in law enforcement are in it for the right reasons um, and do a fantastic job every single day uh, making sure uh, that our communities are safe. Yes, sir. Uh, Governor, several health officials are warning that we could have a new surge uh, in infections from the Omicron variant. Um, I'm just curious if your office is doing anything to prepare for the new variant um, and make sure that people remain as safe as possible. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, it's, 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 it's certainly uh, something that, that we should um, point out. Uh, when those of us in the Sun Belt, in the, south, in the southern states, in July and August uh, went through a very significant surge, um, you, you may uh, remember that there were a lot of uh, those individuals in the national media, I'm sure none of y'all were guilty of this, but there are those in the, in the national media that decided um, that this entire surge was based upon individual decisions that were being made by Mississippians and or uh, by 
uh, decisions that were made by the, the governor of Florida, the governor of Texas, the governor of Mississippi, and, and others. Um, over the last three days uh, in the state of New York, uh, they've had over 20,000 reported cases per day in each of the last three days. Um, New York's about six times the size of Mississippi. Um, what I would submit to you is it's um, and they have some of the most restrictive restrictions uh, in the entire United States right now, uh, but yet this virus is continuing to spread. And, and, and their hospitals uh, in that state and, and many other states are under extreme pressure uh, today. And, and that's certainly something that, that I suggested and predicted three or four months ago. And it's unfortunately for those good people uh, in the Northeast, they're seeing it uh, as we speak. With respect to the, the new variant, um, here's, and, and yes, I've had conversations with our, our state health officials uh, within the last week, and we don't have full data yet uh, to make final determinations, but it seems the early data and even some of the anecdotal um, comments from some of the physicians in South Africa and other places, uh, this particular variant is highly contagious, perhaps more contagious than any other variant that we've seen. And, and is going to spread in the United States very quickly. Uh, I don't think that, that even today that this Omicron variant is the primary um, variant in, uh, for instance, in the Northeast. I think they're still dealing with their Delta um, spread. But that is going to become the primary variant in, in the U.S., and, and it's going to spread quickly in, in a lot of different places. Um, and so we are certainly uh, monitoring it very closely. Uh, the other uh, piece of evidence that is certainly not final yet, but not only does it seem that it is probably more contagious than any other variant that we've dealt with, uh, it also seems that the, the virus is um, slightly less damaging to individuals. Um, the viral load, et cetera, seems to be harming of people at a slightly lesser rate than some of the ones that came before it. Um, and it also seems fairly clear as you look at the evidence, just as we saw in the surge in, in the Delta variant in uh, the late summer, uh, that those individuals who are vaccinated are faring much better uh, than those individuals who are not. And so Mississippi now has just shy of 1.65 million Mississippians that have received at least the first dose, just shy of one and a half million Mississippians that have received at least two doses, uh, and then uh, some number um, that have received uh, both of the first two doses and have even decided to get uh, a third dose that some call uh, the, the booster, uh, and then now there's conversations around whether we should call it the booster or not. But um, clearly those who are, are vaccinated uh, by and large are faring much better. And so just as I have done uh, throughout the, the outset, if you have chosen not to get vaccinated to this point, I would encourage you to talk to your doctor um, and see if that might be the best choice for you um, as a state. Uh, we are going to continue to have um, the same approach that we've had uh, throughout this pandemic, and that is one in which um, we know that we must protect the integrity of the healthcare system in our state, and we are uh, willing to do whatever is necessary to protect uh, that integrity. Um, everything from what we had to do in, in, in August and September to go out and hire literally over a thousand healthcare professionals. When I ran for governor, I never had any inkling that I would be in the business of hiring nurses and doctors and respiratory therapists. Um, but that is, uh, we found ourselves in a position where that became necessary and uh, we, we did what we do and we stepped up and worked through the Mississippi emergency management process and, and worked with our state health officials and, and, and went out and, and literally within days uh, got um, over a thousand healthcare workers uh, in our hospitals throughout the state uh, to relieve uh, some of the stress. Yes, sir. Governor, we're a couple of weeks away from the legislative session beginning in 2022. Do you have any, uh, what are your priorities for that session? Well, clearly, um, we've got a, a lot of work to do uh, during this, this legislative session. Um, uh, we, we have 
uh, when we issued our ex executive budget recommendation, we were um, we took uh, great liberties to uh, convey uh, during that time what our priorities were going to do to be, particularly with respect to uh, the spending uh, of state dollars. Uh, we're going to uh, continue to do various things. I was very pleased to see uh, that in the legislative budget recommendation that the um, <clears throat> the Mississippi legislature, uh, at least that particular committee, agreed with our um, attempt to hire more law enforcement officers at Capitol Police, for instance, to um, continue to police the um, Capitol Complex Improvement District. Um, we're going to continue to uh, to work with the, the leaders on uh, a myriad of things, and um, and we'll continue to uh, uh, have positive results. I hope. Yes. Bobby Harrison has another question. Great. Hey, Governor, a Merry, Merry Christmas to you, too. And just one quick follow-up. You said there was, I think, around $5 million left in the CARES Act money. What, how are you going to spend it? And you have to spend it by the end of this calendar year, I think you said. So how are you going to spend the rest of it? Yeah, I'll, I'll get you a list of, of what we're going to do with the rest of it as, as that becomes um, finalized. As you can imagine, um, a good bit of it is going to be uh, spent in, <clears throat> in ways – uh, in which we are able to um, we are able to help fund some of the increase in overage of expenses in state agencies uh, that primarily report to us but not entirely uh, for instance uh, we're going to spend uh, six hundred and six hundred and eighty eight thousand uh, dollars for an example uh, for the Mississippi Department of Child Protection Services uh, to um, provide to pay for expenses incurred during the COVID-19 state of emergency to provide the frontline services to Mississippi families and at-risk children. As you can imagine, um, CPS is an area that, that we haven't spent a lot of time talking about in the first two years that I've been governor, but that doesn't mean that we haven't spent an enormous amount of time uh, working with Andrea Sanders and her team uh, to get that ship turned around. Um, and, and I got to tell you, they are doing phenomenal work doing so even though um, I'll also let you know that um, this has been an extremely challenging time to do so because obviously it is critically important that those individuals uh, have the ability to meet uh, with those families and with those children uh, that ultimately come into their custody. Uh, they're doing fantastic work and it cost uh, an enormous, uh, it was a, a very large uh, increase uh, to their overall budget. Uh, to to deal with the unique challenges that COVID brought for that particular state agency. And we're going to make sure that we um, reimburse those expenses because we want to um, show that we are not only is it a good faith effort uh, to uh, work with the plaintiffs in the case that we are uh, dealing with, uh, but it's, it's also sincere and it's it, we want to make sure that we have the adequate resources within uh, the Department of Child Protection Services to take care of every one of those uh, young kids. And so that's an example, but Bobby, we'll get you a list and thank you for the question. Yes, sir. Governor, for a question actually for any of the law enforcement that are here, uh, I was curious, what has it been like for the past nearly two years to serve uh, during the coronavirus pandemic? Go um, ahead. Much of the same as it always is, you know, we just, we buckle down and do the job um, no matter what. Uh, sometimes that entails uh, maybe wearing wearing mask, we, you know, in and out of that, and uh, just just doing the job as always. Yeah. So. And I want to mention, you know, oftentimes they were called to show up at, at COVID centers. Um, they they answer calls at night into homes that might have uh, issues with families, and and they're going into those areas often not knowing what they're getting into. I mean, COVID could be rampant in that home and they're exposing themselves. And if you look at the numbers of law enforcement officers and first responders that have died with COVID over the last, since, since the pandemic began, we're gonna be approaching around 50. And, and that's a rather large number. And if you look at it across the country, it's a rather large number. And particularly when, when this COVID started coming out and there were so many unknown variables, they answered the call each and every day because it's not a job that sleeps. It's not a job that can work remotely. 
they show up and they put it on the line, and a lot of them have made the ultimate sacrifice, and that was to the point about the, the death benefit claims. Uh, that's why it's so important that those get paid, as well as this hazard pay. So I, I can tell you in talking with law enforcement officers from across the state, it weighs not only on them, but their family, and, and it's been a very difficult and trying time. That you just mentioned of 50 law enforcement officers is that just Department of Public Safety officers or is that sheriffs police other levels of law enforcement that's other areas of law enforcement based on a survey that we requested we, we sent out a request to the Sheriff's Association police chiefs and the fire associations asking for uh, any numbers that they had of members of their associations that had died with COVID over the last couple of years um, about two months ago the number was in the mid to high 30s uh, so we anticipated it being close to 50 by the time the year ends Governor. just a, a quick clarification also and, and this is one of the reasons uh, that we haven't been able to do this uh, yet you know when you talk about the death benefits uh, plan that was set up it was set up while i was lieutenant governor um, that particular plan um, has some uh, restrictions and some limitations as to who qualifies and and who should and so that's one of the reasons it's very important as we get into the legislative session uh, that we have the ability to um, make some tweaks or maybe set up a new fund for those uh, with COVID, but we want to make sure we get the money in the hands of those families who, who need it. Yes, ma'am. Governor, do you plan a similar tribute such as today, for like the thousands of nurses and doctors, other medical professionals who have like truly borne the brunt of the pandemic? Yeah, we've had um, a lot of Healthcare heroes. Uh, there's no doubt about it. You may you may recall that during the Christmas season last year, uh, we actually um, in our entire uh, theme of our Christmas decorations within the governor's mansion was to honor uh, those healthcare heroes. We literally have thousands and thousands of nurses and doctors and respiratory therapists and and others all across the state uh, that have really stepped up and, and done great work, and and we we commend them. Uh, for doing so and so um, we think that's a uh, extremely important uh, thing to, to say is that, um, that th those men and women who wear the uniform for the state um, so that 1700 or so that I mentioned earlier um, is is one piece of, of the heroes that that have stepped up uh, but it's not the only piece and it's a it's a it's a uh, it's an important piece but not the only piece Yes, sir. Uh, last week, the Legislative Joint Redistricting Committee um, voted to recommend that the full legislature approve uh, a new congressional map. Uh, I'm just curious if you've seen that map and just what your thoughts are about the map and if the legislature does agree um, to approve that, that map um, during, its, uh, during the beginning of the session, um, if you would also uh, yeah, I haven't Yeah, I haven't personally seen the map yet. Um, so I'm not going to comment on the specifics, but um, but once I see it, um, I will I will take a look at it and and we'll decide uh, at that point. Uh, as a reminder, the uh, the executive branch has a role to play in and there are statutes which um, lay out what the the is required uh, of the of the legislature in, in drawing the congressional maps. Um, with respect to the legislative maps, the, the executive does not have a role to play. They draw their own maps, and, and I'm um, watching it very closely because there's certainly always litigation around each and every one of those. Um, but I'm going to withhold comment on the congressional map until I've had an opportunity to personally see it. I have not yet when seen it. When to review it, to look at it? Uh, hopefully sometime uh, between now and when the legislative session starts. Yes, sir. Sir, I know in terms of uh, the state legislature and medical marijuana, um, you said in the past that you want certain limits put in place before you sign off on a bill on that. Um, has anything changed since earlier in the fall, or you have the same stance? No, the, the, as I have said many times, I think the, uh, those individual legislators who worked on the marijuana bill, and, and I know they want you to call it a medical marijuana bill, but I'm going to call it the marijuana bill as it currently exists, um, those individuals who uh, worked on it, made a lot of improvements to the initial draft, uh, and I commend them for those improvements. Um, however, um, as it currently stands, uh, an individual can get a marijuana card by going to their physician, and if you look at the state of Oklahoma, in the state of Oklahoma, 10% of all residents in Oklahoma have a marijuana card. If 
percent of all Mississippi residents get a marijuana card. Um, if we just aren't um, more apt to do it than Oklahoma, but just similarly apt to do it, and if you look at our demographics, it's, there's some similarities. But if 10 percent of Mississippi residents get a marijuana card, that's 300,000 Mississippians will have a marijuana card. Under the law, as it, in its most recent draft, uh, you can get up to three and a half grams of, of the product. Now, the proponents of this particular bill love to talk about grams and they love to talk about uh, all these other things that nobody fully understands. But if you, if you look, um, and you don't even have to be that good, it's a pretty simple Google search, um, three and a half grams would allow for all 300,000 Mississippians with a marijuana card to get up to 11 joints a day. 11 joints a day. It is my view that when you allow 300,000 Mississippians to get 11 joints a day, or approximately 3.3 million joints a day, or almost 1.2 billion joints over a year, that at some point that has become no longer medical marijuana, but recreational marijuana. If there are 1.2 billion joints floating around Mississippi in any one year, I believe that is no longer medicinal. It is no longer for the purpose of helping those who badly need it, uh, and it becomes recreational. I think when you have uh, that many joints available to Mississippians, uh, you're going to see significant um, side effects, uh, not only to those individuals, but side effects to um, society as a whole in Mississippi. I think you're going to see uh, it, it's going to be even harder, for instance, to fill jobs in Mississippi. I think it's going to be even harder to get individuals uh, that we already have a labor shortage in our state. We already have um, a scenario in which uh, those able-bodied 18 to 65-year-olds, uh, their workforce participation rate is lower in Mississippi than in any other state. I think that's likely to get worse, not better. And of course, I think the the crime and other things that go along with it, um, I think, um, are likely to go up. I predict that if the bill passes in its current form, uh, that it's mo the day that it is its most popular, both amongst Mississippians in general, as well as for those uh, uh, Democrats who vote for it, and I think the Democrats will vote for it by and large um, overwhelmingly, and for those Republicans that choose to join them, um, I think it becomes less popular every day after it passes. And so what I've encouraged them to do is to recognize that maybe 1.2 billion joints uh, is too many and, and significantly reduce the total amount um, of marijuana that can be received. Um, so far, uh, we've had conversations regarding that. They don't seem, um, some, of, some of the, um, those who have done the negotiating have not seen likely to uh, want to do that, but we have a legislative process and, and I'm hopeful that uh, there are those that uh, will recognize um, what 11 joints a day uh, will do uh, in our state and will um, uh, hopefully offer amendments and, and do other things to, to change that. So. Yes, sir. Oh, me, sorry. Yes. <laughs> oh. But so, so what, what would your what would you prefer that the gram, that the, that the amount be reduced to? I mean, what would be your, your, your idea area? Well, my preference would be that we had a true medical marijuana program in our state that helped the um, thousand, several thousands of people who truly need medical marijuana um, that have uh, a physician. My preference would be that we had, uh, like we do with every other um, medical drug, uh, a pharmacist involved. Uh, my preference would be uh, that should that not be possible that we significantly reduce the overall number of uh, uh, overall amount of, of marijuana that's made available um, and and so there's there's a number of different ways uh, to skin the cat but given the current bill uh, if they significantly reduce that three and a half grams uh, to a level uh, that I could live with, um, then I could uh, I could sign a bill. Um, but under as it's currently written, uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. Governor, the FDA has recently approved a measure that allows for the mailing of abortion pills 
do you think the state will be limiting uh, access to that in the future? You know, I, I saw uh, that the FDA did that. I, it's, um, it's yet another example that in this administration uh, there is nothing that is not um, uh, there's nothing that is off limits to political decisions, um, and we'll deal with it as as we move forward. Governor, I wanted to ask the basis of the swipe that you just took for dem against Democrats on the medical marijuana. The people in charge of negotiating this, as you know, are Republicans. What, what is your basis? I'm just for saying? My, my only basis, Emily, is that I expect that the Democrats in the legislature are going to vote for this bill, um, and I sus and I expect um, because they've been um, they've been supportive of, of similar legislation in the past. They've um, uh, filed similar legislation in the past, and, and my, what I expect is that there are going to be a large number of Republicans vote for it as well, uh, but I think there's also going to be a large number of Republicans that vote against it. And so, you know, we'll see what, what happens um, as we get to the legislative session. I'm, I'm hopeful that we can find um, at least um, 18 senators and, and 44 or 45 House members that are willing to vote against it so that we can negotiate a, a true um, medical marijuana program in our state. Because I really do believe that as uh, these uh, green buildings start going up in communities in every, uh, every uh, opportunity around the state, uh, this thing is going to become a lot less popular every single day after it passes. And so when it, when it comes to this particular bill, um, if there are a large number of Democrats who, who want to vote against it and, and want to vote to sustain a veto, um, we would welcome that. Uh, another question about the session. Will you support efforts to revive the initiative process? Sure. Yeah. We, I think that that's a, um, I think that um, access to the ballot is, is important. Um, I don't think that a one person writing a two or three million dollar check on any one issue and to put it in our state constitution is, is the, the correct way to do it. But I do think that the citizens should have access to the ballot, and, and it ought to be done in a way where it's challenging to get on the ballot, but that it's possible. And I know a lot of people have called for a mechanism to amend the state code, to amend state law as well as uh, the Constitution. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's certainly a, uh, an avenue that the legislature may take. Uh, it certainly seems to make... Um, it seems to make sense to me uh, that you amend statutes and you, you let your uh, voice be heard uh, rather than putting things like marijuana in the state constitution. Uh, I'll give you an example. I mean, there's no question uh, that there, there, are, um, there, there are a lot of people, uh, in fact, even if, in my view, even if you are uh, pro-marijuana, uh, even if you're pro-recreational marijuana, it seems to me that that should be um, in statute, not in the Constitution, um, long term, and, and and plus it's it's a it also is a way in which to um, to do it. Look, we live in a um, a form of government more as a uh, uh, republic than as a true democracy. Um, if if we if we ran everything uh, as a true democracy, we would be in a state called California, uh, where fifty percent of the voters go. Uh, to the polls and vote for one thing and then the same electric goes back to the polls and votes not to fund whatever it is that they voted to do and it, it really creates chaos and and it's very difficult um, by and large we we elect in our state we elect uh, every every uh, office holder at the county and city and state level and and um, and so um, i do think people should have access to the ballot but i i don't think we should have four or five ballot initiatives every time we have an election Well, look, thank you all for being here. Thank you all for the questions. If I don't see you between now and Saturday, um, please have a, a Merry Christmas, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it.